Okay, so here we are. We've painted our single time point data set onto the cellular overview diagram using the full range of available colors. And, you know, at a glance you may not, not know what the colors mean. So we're going to cruise over to the right here where we have, as always, our legend. So when I explained the default coloration, I didn't really get into exactly how that works. So what happens with the default coloration is that we use this full range of colors with yellow indicating a fold change downward, uh, cruising up to red indicating changes upward in expression, or in value in this case, because of course we could be gene expression, protein expression, metabolite levels, whatever. And we set the boundaries of this color rainbow to the boundaries of your expression level. So in this case, our largest expression change is 3.4 log units from the middle. And that could be a positive change or a negative change, but what we do is we set the boundaries to the color range to the largest value. So for example, if our value had instead been plus two log units or minus two log units, and that was the maximum divergence from, uh, from the baseline, then plus two would have been red and minus two would have been yellow. In addition to that, we have this histogram down here that shows you your distribution of genes across the different expression levels. And things on the left side of the histogram are things that appear in the metabolic overview. Things on the right side of the histogram are things that don't appear in the metabolic overview. Um, unsurprisingly, there are a lot more genes from our expression set that don't appear in the metabolic overview. Now, if you want to look at all the genes and see them all displayed, of course, you're going to want the genome omics viewer. And as I mentioned before, that'll be discussed a little later on, uh, either once we get it put up on the web or in a future webinar in the near future that will discuss things available on the desktop version. And down at the bottom of the page here, we have a report. So every time you use the omics viewer for a single data file, you're going to get a report like this. And the report will show you things like total number of data rows, not including comment lines, in this case about 4,300 because we're looking at E. coli genes. Total number of rows for which a gene could not be found, 37. That means that it looked at the name we had there and it couldn't match it to anything in our PGDB. Now, you might wonder why that would happen. Uh, typically, it's going to happen because of some mismatch in naming or more often, you know, we probably are looking at expression data that comes from a slightly different strain of E. coli, something along those lines. Then the number of rows for which the gene name was ambiguous, too. That means it could match it to more than one object and it couldn't figure that out. Number of rows for which the gene is valid, but for which a data value was missing or malformed. Now this is an important one. We have it at zero because we entered stuff correctly. Now remember, we're looking at log data. If I had forgotten to indicate that and had actually clicked on the absolute data thing, then every negative value would count as malformed. And you'd see something like 2,000 rows that were malformed. So if you ever see a huge number of malformed rows, you've made a mistake. Go back, look at your file, look at your entry parameters, make sure that you've set things up properly. And that's, I really like this report because it'll let you optimize your data viewing and it will catch just basic mistakes so you don't sit there staring at the omics display wondering, wow, you know, I really thought I'd see a more dramatic effect, but I don't. So down here then we have also data statistics, number of values, number in the overview, minimum value, maximum value. So we see that our range in the overview is set by a minimum value. So as I mentioned, our color range there is set to the maximum difference in one of the directions, whichever one is biggest. In this case, minus 3.4 log units, a minus 3.4 log unit change down is our biggest change. Our biggest increase is 2.6, but the range in both directions is set to the biggest change, so about 3.4 log units. Then other useful information, and above we told you 37 objects could not be found. It would be entirely obnoxious if we didn't tell you what those objects were. So for each of these categories, we tell you what the, what the objects are. So you can go back and see, wow, why can't I link these up to database objects? And then at the bottom, we have instructions for saving this diagram locally so you don't have to load the data each time. You can have a file that you can, that you can just load at will. So let's go back up here and let's pick a pathway that has some interesting changes. 
So let's look at this. We can see that the compound is DUDP. The pathway is de novo synthesis of pyramid, pyrimidine deoxyribonucleotides. We get to this pop-up view of the pathway, which you will remember, hopefully, from part one of this webinar series. And in this case, there's a lot of interesting things I want to point out on this pop-up view. So let's just scroll over a little bit. Okay, so if you're following along, you may have had the thought, wait a minute, what if I have isozymes? And that's an excellent question because, of course, many activities are coded for by more than one gene. And this is also a good point to bring up here about what we're actually displaying here. So we're displaying stuff on the edges, which you'll recall are reactions, and on the nodes in some cases. So what's going on there? Well, when you put in gene data, we're going to show you those gene expression changes on anything that we can tie directly to the gene. So in this case, all these edges go back to one or more enzymes that catalyze that reaction, and these enzymes are in turn coded for by genes. So for example, we have this gene TMK, and we see that its expression has dropped a bit in this time point. We map that expression onto the enzyme coded for by that gene, and that in turn maps onto this reaction edge in the overview. Of course, if we had flux analysis for reactions, we could map that on directly. And you'll notice, if you look up at the display, that we have some of the nodes, that's things that are being operated on by reactions, uh, colored in also. And that's because those nodes are proteins. So in many cases, you're looking at proteins that undergo some kind of change, like down on the bottom left of the display here, you can see a lot of these two-component signaling pathways. And so since we have proteins in the display, we can map their gene expression levels directly onto the proteins coded for by those genes. So in this way, you can kind of infer a little bit about what's happening to these metabolic activities, or at least what the cell's trying to do with them, by how gene expression levels related to these activities change. But back to the thing that sparked this discussion, what do we do about isozymes? Well, our basic decision was it's unwieldy to show multiple coloring points for a given edge in the over, overall display. It just doesn't work well, uh, especially since some reactions may be catalyzed by four isozymes or five isozymes, and at the level of resolution of the whole display, that just doesn't work. So in this case, what we do is we paint the most extreme change onto the overall display with the idea being that you're looking for changes. So if you're interested in that pathway, if you want to see changes that happen in response to some condition, that's what you're going to want to be seeing on the overall display to flag your attention. Then, once you zoom in on a pathway or click through to the pathway, you'll actually see what we're seeing right now, which is every single result painted on. So, for example, if we go up here, we can see that both of these uh, reaction edges are carried out by two isozymes. And we've painted both values on, and we're displaying the actual numerical values here as well. So you can see, for example, that both edges on this side um, have been down-regulated, apparently. And the edges on this side are kind of down and up-regulated, but not a whole lot in either direction. And similarly, you can look at each different component in the pathway and see expression changes up or down. So if you see a big change when you're looking at the omics view, go get the tooltip to pop up, take a look at the pathway, and you can see, are there isozymes? Are some of the things going up? All others are not, etc. So now let's go over and close this. Oh.